يا ربي لك الحمد حتى ترضى ولك الحمد إذا ما رضيت ولك الحمد بعد رضائي ولك الحمد أبدا 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 والحمد لله الذي أنزل على عبده الكتاب ولم يجعل له عوجا والحمد لله الذي لم يتخذ ولدا ولم يكن له شريك في الملك ولم يكن له ولي من الذل وكبره تكبيرا والحمد لله الذي نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شكر أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبد الله ورسوله أرسله الله تعالى بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله وكفى بالله شهيدا فصلى الله عليه وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا ثم أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وإن شر الأمور محدثاتها وإن كل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار يقول سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه الكريم بعد أن أقول أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم سيقول السفهاء من الناس ما ولاهم عن قبلتهم التي كانوا عليها قل لله المشرق والمغرب يهدي من يشاء إلى صراط مستقيم وكذلك جعلناكم أمة وسطا لتكونوا شهداء على الناس ويكون الرسول عليكم شهيدا وما جعلنا القبلة التي كنت عليها إلا لنعلم من يتبع الرسول ممن ينقلب على عقبيه وإن كانت لكبيرة إلا على الذين هدى الله وما كان الله ليضيع إيمانكم إن الله بالناس كرؤوف الرحيم وبشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم ثبتنا عند الموت بلا إله إلا الله اللهم اجعلنا من الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصدر أمين يا رب العالمين In today's brief khutbah, I'd like to share with you a couple of reminders from the middle of Surah Al-Baqarah. And these ayat are of particular interest to me and I believe to all Muslims because they inaugurate us, they congratulate us from Allah that we have become a distinct nation, a distinct ummah. And before I get into those ayat where Allah congratulates us that we are an ummah by ourselves, a nation by ourselves, with a unique identity, I want to share with you what happens before this, these ayat come. Allah Azza wa Jal leads up to this argument or this inauguration. Before this, there's a lot of conversation in this beautiful surah. The main conversation before this is a long track record of Bani Israel. In Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah called the sons of Israel, the sons of Israel, He called them out. He started by saying, أُذْكُرُوا نِعْمَةِ يَلَّتِي أَنْعَمْتُ عَلَيْكُمْ وَأَنِّي فَضَّلْتُكُمْ عَلَى الْعَالَمِينَ Make mention of them my favor on you. And that I had given you preference over all other nations of the world. And if you're forgetting that favor, how about I remind you? And so Allah dedicates several passages, several passages in Surah Al-Baqarah, reminding the Israelites what He had done for them time and time and time and time again. They messed up and Allah helped them out. They messed up again and Allah helped them out again and again and again. They even messed up with their messenger. They even started insulting their messenger. They even started questioning the instructions of Musa السلام, to his face. They even said the most obnoxious things like, We won't believe in anything you have to say. We won't accept any of your demands until we see Allah face to face. Imagine saying that to a messenger. Then they went further. Later on, Allah Azza wa mentions, then when the words were given to them directly, a group among the leaders of Bani Israel were taken and they heard the word of Allah. And they were told directly by Allah, خُذُوا أَتَيْنَاكُمْ بِقُوَّةٍ Allah held the mountain above them and told them, hold, up, hold on to whatever we have given you with great might, with every str all the strength you have, hold on to the instructions, the Torah that we are giving you. 
And then Allah mentions that right after that, they forgot and they, they turned around and they disobeyed. So Allah makes a list of crimes, a list of mistakes that Bani Israel made. Then after all of that, Allah starts talking about Ibrahim salam. After making a huge list of their errors, He starts talking about Ibrahim salam. The question arises, why? You know, one of the main reasons that the Jews of Medina did not accept the Prophet والسلام, as the final messenger is because he was not from the children of Israel. He wasn't from among them. And Allah makes the argument, yes he is, because even your father is Ibrahim, and this is also a son of Ibrahim salam. He takes us back to the common origin. He takes Bani Israel back to the common beginning. Because if you argue he's not from the family, well you're from the family of Ibrahim and so is he. So Allah takes, back, takes them back to the origin. Then Allah Azza wa Jal mentions what Ibrahim salam has told his son Ishaq. Okay? And he said this to, to uh, what Ishaq salam then told to his children. مَا تَعْبُدُونَ مِنْ بَعْدِي What are you going to worship after I'm gone? What are you going to be obeying after I'm gone? <coughs> and they said, نَعْبُدُ إِلَاهَكَ وَإِلَاهَ آبَائِكَ إِبْرَاهِيمَ وَإِسْمَعِيلَ وَإِسْحَاقَ they said, Ibrahim, Ismail, Ishaq. The sons of Israel were being asked, Israel alayhi salam himself, Yaqub alayhi salam, by the way, his other name is Israel. He was asking his sons, what are you going to worship after I'm gone? And his sons, by the way, you know we call, them, we call the Jews the sons of Israel. These are the original sons of Israel. They aren't even grandkids of Israel, they're the direct sons of Israel. And they say, you know what, we're going to be worshiping Allah himself, just like Ibrahim did, and Ishaq, the Ismail did, and Ishaq did. Who did they mention? Ismail alayhi salam. They themselves honored Ismail alayhi salam. So Allah is telling the Jews, your own fathers honored Ismail alayhi salam. How, can you, how come you don't honor him? How come you don't consider his children a legitimate legacy? So he makes that argument. He makes it clear. Because he quotes their fathers directly. First he quotes Ibrahim alayhi salam, then he quotes Ismail alayhi salam himself. To make the common lineage clear. To the Muslims and to the non-Muslims. So this becomes clear to them. After all of that, there's a sudden change. And before this sudden change happens, Allah says something really interesting that I want to bring to my attention and yours. He mentions this amazing concern of Ibrahim salam and Yaqub salam and mentions at the end, That's a nation, they're already gone. They already left. They have whatever they earn. And you're going to have whatever you're going to earn. Don't reminisce about the past and say, Oh man, we belong to the legacy of the Prophets. They were so awesome. We're not, but they were. And maybe just because we say they're so awesome, we should just kind of slide into Jannah ourselves. No, 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 no. You can't dwell into the past and reminisce about the past and be proud of your past and say, Because of that pride, we should be alright. No, no, no. They earned what they earned. لَهَا مَا كَسَبَتْ وَلَكُمْ مَا كَسَبْتُمْ وَلَا تُسْأَلُونَ عَمَّا كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ You are not going to be interrogated about what they used to do. You're not going to be asked. Even though we should know the story of Ibrahim السلام, of Ishaq السلام, of Yaqub we should know these stories. But Allah says, I'm not going to ask you what they did first. I'm going to ask you what you did first. I'm going to ask you what you were up to. So you know, this brings me to a very important point. <coughs> there are two kinds of nations. Nations that move forward and nations that just go backwards. And the nations that move forward are worried about their future. And the nations that go back backwards, they only take pride in their past and they don't think anything about the future. And the Muslims are becoming more and more like that. All we think about is our past. Oh man, the times of Umar. So awesome. That's great. How will we bring those times back? You're here now. We have to learn from that past, but we have to put work towards our future. We have to think ahead. But now Allah says, does two things. He was talking to Bani Israel, he already told them in Surah Al-Baqarah, I gave you guys preference. I had given you preference over all other nations. And one of those honors that they had was that they had the capital of Islam to them. That any believer would pray, they would pray in the direction of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. 
حتى الرسول صلى الله عليه وسلم even the messenger of Allah عليه الصلاة والسلام used to pray in the direction of al Masjid al Aqsa when he was living in Mecca. The Prophet used to pray in that direction. But the interesting thing was in Mecca there's the house built by Ibrahim عليه السلام and Allah has still kept the instruction because you know until Allah says otherwise what was revealed to Musa alayhi salam is still valid. This, our book confirms previous revelation, doesn't contradict it, it confirms it. So unless Allah says you have to do differently, the Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa is still the Qibla. But the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam did not want to put his back to the Kaaba. So he used to pray in a way that he would be making sajda to, or in the direction of the Kaaba and in the same line, Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. But what happened then is that the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam moved. He moved to Medina. And when he moved to Medina, he still has to pray towards Al-Aqsa. He has, still has to pray towards Jerusalem. But this time, if he prays towards Jerusalem, his back is going to be to Mecca. Before he could line both of them up. Now he can't. Because Medina is in between both of them. So he has to literally put his back to Mecca if he wants to pray towards Jerusalem. And this hurt his feelings. Because he knew that is the house built by his father, Ibrahim alayhi salam. That's the house of Allah built by his father Ibrahim. He knew this. And it hurt his feelings that he has to turn his back towards that house. He didn't complain to Allah. He didn't complain to Allah. I'll tell you what he did later. It's coming in these ayat. It's incredible. It really is. But when the Muslim, eventually Allah did change the instructions and said, no, 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 no you no longer pray towards Al-Aqsa, now you pray towards Al-Kaaba. The new capital of Islam is Mecca. The old capital has been eliminated. The old capital has been suspended. You know when you suspend a capital, when you move the presidential concerns to somewhere else, you make something else the center, then it's a kind of humiliation. So Bani Israel were really upset. This ayah covers why they were so upset. They say, The fools from among the people, Allah calls them fools here. He says, fools from among the people will say, what's wrong with these people? What turned them from their qibla? They used to pray in the same direction that we did, and all of a sudden now they're praying towards Mecca. What happened to them? The one that they used to be committed to. You know, this is something we should think about. The Jews of Medina did not recognize the Prophet as a messenger, right? They didn't accept Islam. They did not accept Islam. So if, they, if the Muslims are deviant, if the Muslims are not on the truth, whether they pray left, right, north, south, east, west, what do you care? Why should you care if they pray towards Aqsa or not? You don't believe the, he's the true messenger anyway. The fact that they got offended was already proof that they knew that he is the messenger of Allah. Because they didn't want that attention of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa And Allah's benefits to turn from Al-Aqsa to Al-Masjid Al-Haram. So they wouldn't have, you know if, for example, Christians decide they're going to move their church this way or that way, what do the Muslims care? Us sitting in this masjid, whether we pray backwards or forwards, what do the Christians care? They don't care, it's a different religion. They're like, do whatever you want in there, I don't care. Why would the Jews care? Why would they even be so offended? Because they knew deep down inside, this is the messenger. They knew deep down inside, that is Allah's favor. That Allah, is, we're still, still praying in our same direction. We're still okay. Allah's not that angry. Come on, they're praying like we do. They even fast on the same days that we do. You know the Prophet used to fast on the same days, Ali Salaam is the Jews? He used to fast on the same days as the Jews. So the first thing Allah does is, no, 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 you pray in a different direction now. They're offended. Wait, things are changing? Things are changing. And He didn't just change the direction of prayer. What else did He do a couple of ayat later? You know what? You fast on different days too. Shahru Ramadan, Ulladhi Utilafi in Qur'an. You fast in Ramadan. Not, not as the same as the Jews anymore. You have your own month to fast. And Allah mentioned in that ayah of Ramadan, when He was making us distinct from the Jews, He said, Hudan lin nasi. It is guidance for all people. What did the Jews believe at the time? They believed guidance is only for their nation. Allah says, no, this time is for everybody. Hudan lin nasi. SubhanAllah. And He didn't just say, you pray on a different month. He said, you pray in a different month because the Qur'an is revealed in that month. This is the revelation now, not the old one. Now you have to follow this one. Now you have to follow Qur'an. What I'm trying to tell you is the changing of the Qibla and the month of Ramadan, both of those things are a way by which Allah made us a unique nation. Allah made us different from the previous nations. He made us a separate identity. And when He made this big change of change in prayer, Allah Azza wa says, 
Congratulations. We have now, therefore, and that is how we have made you a middle nation. You guys, you guys have now become a nation of your own. A middle nation. The word middle is a deep discussion. What does Allah mean by a middle nation? You know, there was a nation before us that worried so much about their spirituality that they even started doing things that don't even make sense because of their spirituality. And there was a nation before us that was so intellectual that their hearts became hard. They were all intellectual, no spirituality. On the other side, there was a group that was entirely spiritual and they even denied their intellect. Allah became one of three. We were the nation in the middle. We're a nation that is intellectual and maintains our spirituality. This is one of the benefits of the middle nation. One of the many benefits. وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطًا You know when you're congratulated on something, you feel good about yourself. But the moment Allah congratulates us, He puts a huge responsibility on our shoulders. And that is really the crux of what I want to share with you today. Not just that Allah made us a distinct nation, but the moment He gave us this title, it was like a job. He gave us almost like a job. And so the moment you're given the title, you're given your job description. This is what you have to do. He says, لِتَكُونُوا شُهَدَاءَ عَلَى النَّاسِ so that all of you may be witnesses against humanity. All of you have to bear witness against mankind. In other words, all of mankind is heading away from this deen. They're heading away from Islam. You have been made an ummah so you can bear witness, show the people what Islam is. And when they see Islam in your life, when they see, see Islam in your tongue, when they see Islam in your understanding, when they see Islam in your character, in your personality, in your <coughs> business dealings, in the kind of student you are in college, the kind of high school student you are, the kind of family you raise, the kind of neighbor you are, when they see Islam like that and they still turn away from Islam, then Allah will say, you had a witness. You, these people are witness <coughs> against you. You saw the beauty of Islam and you still didn't come to Islam. You are supposed to be a witness against all of mankind by becoming people of the middle ummah. This is what you and I are supposed to be. But, you and I have to ask ourselves a really scary question. Are we representing Islam in a way that anybody sees it and says, this is an amazing religion. These guys are awesome. They're so honest. They always tell the truth. This guy doesn't even hit on any girls. He's in college, he doesn't hit on any girls. He doesn't go party. He doesn't a filthy word ever comes out of his mouth. He's so respectful to his teacher. He's incredibly respectful to his parents. She's so modest and kind and honest. How do they do that? Is that our character? When people work with us at our office place, they say, this guy is always on time. Whenever he says he's going to finish the product, project, he finishes the project. He's so incredibly honest. This grocery store owner, man, he's so insanely honest. If he gives me one gram more or one gram less of rice, he hunts me down in the parking lot and says, here, take some more rice, I think I give you 0 0.01 grams less. I don't want to answer Allah. Is that the kind of Muslim we are? Is that the kind of witness against humanity we've become? SubhanAllah, how far we've come. I travel a lot, and I, I, you know, I, I graduated in, from business school a long time ago. And you know, I've, I've had my share of experience doing business with Muslims, non-Muslims, etc. And if somebody, I used to live in New York City, a very interesting place, you meet all kinds of people, right? People come to me and say, brother, I'm starting a business, I'm opening a restaurant. There's a Muslim brother I met at the masjid. I want to partner with him. I was like, run away. <laughs> Muslim? Well, don't, don't do business. I have seen maybe two, 200 massages. I think almost 200 massages all across America. And if I talk about honesty, some brother comes up at the end, brother, you're right. There was this brother I met, he was so religious. He knew so much Qur'an. He was, I used to look up to him. But when we got into business, he took my money and ran away. You know how many times I've heard that myself? How many stories like that? And then people say, ah, these people, they act really religious, they look really religious, but they're not honest people, they're not decent people, they're cheaters, they're scammers, they're this and that. And you know what? Even Muslims, the vast majority of Muslims aren't even that religious. Forget attracting non-Muslims to Islam, most Muslims are turned away from Islam when they see religious people, or people that at least look religious, and these people are all fake. All these guys with beards, they're all, I know what they're really like. All these mullahs. 
Forget attracting non-Muslims to Islam, being witness against them. We're even becoming witness against Muslims who say, I don't come to the masjid, I don't want to deal with those people. I know what they're like. I know what they're like. They don't keep their word. They'll stab you in the back. They'll recite the surah with perfect tajweed though. You know, but they'll stab you in the back anyway. But this is what we've become. <coughs> this is what we've become. And Allah Azza wa Jal warned us about a nation that came before that looked religious that look knowledgeable, that used to pretend to be very pious, and yet their dealings and their business dealings and their behind the back, all of it was backstabbing. That was Bani Israel. That wasn't us. Before Allah told us we're an ummah and we're honored as an ummah and we pray in the direction of the Qibla to revive the legacy of Ibrahim salam. Allah spent half the surah telling us this is what you shouldn't be. Guys, this is what you should not be. Now you're an ummah. Now you're an ummah. And look at the state of our ummah today. Don't even look to across the Atlantic. Don't even look at what's happening in the Muslim world or the corruption that's there. Let's look at our own, in our own self. Let's look and ask our own conscience. What kind of people are? What kind of masajid do we run? What kind of schools do we? What kind of Islamic organizations do we run? What kind of businesses do we run? How do we deal with our families? How fair are you to your wife? How fair are you to your husband? How fair are you to your business partner? How, off, how, how timely do you pay your employees? You know? These are, we have to ask ourselves these really hard questions. Because we have to be witnesses against humanity, but Allah didn't stop there. He said, And so that the Messenger وسلم, could be a witness against you. I'll say it again. So the Messenger, that, لم يقول لكم شهيدا قال عليكم شهيدا هناك فرق كبير عظيم It's a huge difference between saying that the Messenger of Allah will be a witness for you Allah didn't say that, He said that the Messenger of Allah will be a witness against you against you He will stand before Allah on the Day of Judgment like all of the other Messengers You know Isa alayhi salam stands on Judgment Day If you read some of the Madani Surahs, you'll find some really interesting conversation Allah is very angry when He talks to Isa alayhi salam did you say to people, take Allah, take me and my mother as gods besides Allah? Did you say that to people? And you wonder, why is Allah so angry at Isa a.s.? He knows he didn't say that. Why is he, why is he scolding Isa a.s. like that? You know why? Because the Christians who lived their entire life hoping that when the Day of Judgment comes, who will save us? Jesus will save us. So they're on the Day of Judgment, they're looking around for Jesus and say, Oh, look, Jesus right there. We're just going to hide behind him and he can deal with God. He can deal with God. And Allah starts with Isa said, Did you say this with people? So he's getting scolded in front of all of those who had their hopes with Isa alayhi salam. If he's getting talked to like that, what's going to happen to us? What's going to happen to us? They're, all their hopes are shattered. Allah is not punishing Isa alayhi salam. He's shattering the hopes of those who do shirk in those words. It's powerful. What does Allah do to his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? In Surah Al-Nisa, the Messenger of Allah asked Hassan ibn Thabit, I believe it was, who had a beautiful voice, asked him to recite Qur'an for him. And he said, I'm going to recite for you, Messenger of Allah. And he said, yeah, I'd love to listen to it. So he starts reciting Qur'an. And the Messenger starts listening, sallallahu alayhi wa And he gets to the ayah, وَكَيْفَ إِذَا جِئْنَا إِن كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ بِشَهِيدٍ وَجِئْنَا بِكَ عَلَى هَأُولَئِ عَلَى هَأُولَئِ شَهِيدًا how will it look when we bring, bring a witness against every nation and we will bring you as a witness against these people? This is a surah, ayatan madaniya, qissa madaniya. This is a madani story. Ha'ulai means these, not those. Ula'ika means those, far away. Ha'ulai means these, right here, these Muslims. How will it look when I bring you, O Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa I will make you testify against them. Testify against your own nation. Testify against the Muslims. What does that mean? And by the way, when the Messenger heard it, he was in tears, he's begging the Sahabi, Hasbuk, Hasbuk, stop, I can't listen anymore. I can't take anymore. I have to do that? I have to bear witness against my own nation? My own people? Allah will make him testify. He will make him testify. What's the testimony he will make him take? You know, the day when the Messenger's mission was done, sallallahu alayhi wa he turned to the entire Ummah, he said, did I do my job? Basically. 
Did I do my job? Did I fulfill this mission? Did I deliver the message to you? And the entire ummah test, yes, you delivered it. You gave the amana, a date al amana. You did it. Now that they, we testify to that, this ummah testified to that, that means his job is done, now the responsibility is ours. So when Allah comes to him on judgment day and says, did you do your job? He says, yes. They agreed that I did my job. So the only one left who didn't do a job is us. This is the last thing I want to share with you guys. It is so heavy, Wallahi, just appreciating this gives the Muslim a sense of responsibility like nothing else. Before I tell you what it is, I want to compare two things. Allah had given the Messenger of Allah, Musa alayhi salam, before, Musa alayhi salam. Allah had given him a mission also. And when Allah had given him a mission on the mountain of Tu, the conversation between Allah and Musa alayhi salam happened. Allah had given him a mission, and Musa alayhi salam immediately made a whole list of problems. Ya Allah, this mission is really hard. Uh, they have an arrest warrant out for me. وَلَهُمْ عَلَيَّ ذَمٌ فَأَخَافُ أَنْ يَقْتُلُونَ They have a crime listed against me. I accidentally killed the guy. So even if I try to go talk to Fir'aun, because Allah didn't tell them, إِذْهَ بِلَا بِسْوَى He said, إِذْهَ بِلَا فِرْعَوْنَ Go to Fir'aun. Fir'aun's not sitting in a backyard somewhere. Where is he sitting? In the palace. You have to go all the way through Egypt, through the guards, into the central palace, in the, in, inside the quarters, and then talk to Fir'aun. How do you even get there if you're a criminal in that society? How do you even get there? He says, my tongue stutters. I get frustrated easily. My chest becomes tight. My tongue stops moving. Can you send Harun with me? Oh, and by the way, they're going to kill me if they see me. He makes a whole list of problems. In Surah Taha, he makes another list of problems. He makes another list of problems. <coughs> and so he says all of his problems, and then Allah answers him and says, Yeah, I'll take care of it. Don't worry about it. All done. All of your requests? Agree. agree. I'll take care of it. Let's turn to Rasulullah. I told you he used to pray in the direction of Allah. And now his back was to where? Mutibla. And it used to hurt his feelings. He didn't even ask Allah. He didn't ask Allah. Allah says, قَدْ نَرَى تَقَلُّبَ وَجْهِكَ فِي السَّمَاءِ We saw your face turning to the sky. We already saw it. فَلَيَنَّكَ Then we swear to it, there is no doubt about it whatsoever, we are changing it for you. قِبْلَةً A direction. طَرْبَاهَ That makes you happy. This Ummah has a new identity and Allah describes the reason in the Qur'an it will make the Messenger of Allah happy. And he didn't even ask وسلم, He just did what? Turn to the sky and look at the sky. That's all he did. And Allah Azzawajal changed the direction for billions of people on this planet. The way you're going to pray will change because this man وسلم, will look at the sky. He didn't even say a word yet. He didn't even say a word. And that is how important he is to Allah. That is how much he matters to Allah. That he doesn't even ask and this happens. And now imagine that same messenger وسلم, when he is brought on judgment day and he is made to speak against someone. When he is made to complain against someone. Do you think anybody can come as a defense attorney now? Anybody can be saved from that now? If he says even one word against somebody وسلم, what are they going to do in front of Allah? What are they going to do? The Quran records, وَقَالَ الرَّسُولُ يَا إِنَّ قَوْمِ اتَّخَذُوا هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ مَهْجُورًا The Messenger will say on that day, Master, this nation of mine, they took this Quran and abandoned it. They left it abandoned. They didn't care about it. إِنَّ قَوْمِ اتَّخَذُوا هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ مَحْجُورًا This is the testimony of Allah's Messenger against His own people who don't give His... This book, this book that we have printed, beautiful covers and glossy print, sitting in every single masjid. This book took 23 years of the Messenger struggle, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How much blood was shed? How much blood was spilled? How many insults did the Messenger of Allah take, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? How many times was he beat? How many times was he hurt? How many times was his family caused pain? How many times did he pass out in battle sallallahu alayhi wa How many days he had to starve in his life? So one day we can recite this book. What have we done for this book? What kind of time?
time have we given this book? Oh, a week for all I got time. I don't have time right now. It's too hard. It's, I get bored when I read it. You know how many people say that? People standing in Tarawih, yawning. Like it's, uh, it's just eight is enough. Ah, today I just do four. It's too much. It's too much Quran. Do we even realize what we have? How it got to us? Who made the struggles to get this book to us? Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Whose words these are? And so I want to leave you. In these like two minutes, I want to leave you. I told you Allah has talked a lot about Bani Israel and how they messed up and then they told us about us being an ummah. I want to leave you with just what Allah says about Bani Israel and their book. One of the most shocking things I've ever read. One of the most powerful things I've ever read. يَقُولْ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَى وَمِنْهُمْ أُمِّيُّونَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ الْكِتَابَ إِلَّا أَمَانِيَّةِ وَإِنْهُمْ إِلَّا يَظُنُّونَ Among them, meaning Bani Israel, are unlettered people. They don't even know how to read. They don't even know, even if they read, they don't understand anything. لَا يَعْلَمُونَ الْكِتَابَ They don't know the book. إِلَّا أَمَانِيَّةِ Except wishful thoughts. All they know is wishful thoughts. In other words, they don't know what the book says. They think they know what it says. They think they know what it says. They have no idea what it says. You met Muslims like that? They don't know the book, but they think they know what it says. I think the Quran talks about this or that. I'm pretty sure it's there somewhere. Not, not the time to read it though. Allah describes when He saw it, says, Among them are unlettered people, they don't know the book except their own wishful thoughts. Wa in whom illa yadunnun, and they are making nothing but very confident assumptions. Vun is very confident. You're, you, you're, you know you're making it up, but you're really confident when you talk about it. <laughs> You don't say, I'm not sure, but you, like, you talk like you're really sure, even though you know you don't know what you're talking about. Like you're a car salesman or something. Right? And so what does is, what is Ibn Abbas ta'ala, say about this ayah? The Mufassir of Qur'an. الذي فقه الله الدين The one Allah gave him understanding of deen. What did he say about this ayah? Allah described how is it that they don't know their book. Not, Allah says they don't know their book. But Ibn Abbas wants us to understand what does that mean? He says, Amani, these wishful thoughts that Allah is talking about, that they don't really know, they just make wishful thoughts. Amani ay tilawa. Ya'adamunahu hifdan wa qira'atan bila fahmin la yadruna ma fiha inna ma yaqtasiruna ala ma yukta alayhi. He says, what Allah says here is all they do with their book is they memorize some of it and they recite some of it. That's it. They have no idea what's in it. They have no clue what's inside. They're very happy that it should be recited to them. Otherwise, they're okay. They don't care anything more. They don't even need to understand what it says. If you go around the educated, well-off, well-established, up-and-coming Muslim community in the United States, some of the smartest Muslims in the world live in the United States. Some of the wealthiest Muslims in the world live in the United States. Some of the brightest minds of Pakistan and India and Egypt and Algeria and Morocco and Indonesia and Malaysia live in the United States. From all over the Muslim world, people come here and do their higher studies. Some of the smartest people we have, go to any Muslim community and ask the question, find me a group of people that recite a book, they like to memorize a book, they like it when it's recited, but most of them have no idea what it says. Can you find me a nation like that? Can you, is that Bani Israel? Is that, who is that? SubhanAllah. What a scary question to ask. Ibn Abbas was not describing the Muslims. He was not describing the Muslims. He was describing Bani Israel. But you read, you read his description and you stand there and you shift. How are we going to stand in front of the testimony when Allah's Messenger says, we abandoned this book? When He says, this nation abandoned Quran. This nation abandoned Quran. May Allah Azza not make us of the people who abandoned Quran. You know, I don't just want to scare you and myself. This deen is full of hope. It is full of hope. It is never too late for anyone. Never too late for anyone. And someone says, where do I start with Quran? It's such a huge book, it's so hard. I can't even recite one ayah properly. What do I do? Just, t just think of one thing and I I'll let you go. One thing. Don't listen to me, don't listen to anybody else. Just listen to Allah. وَلَقَدْ يَسَّرْنَا الْقُرْآنَ لِلْذِكْرِ آمِنُوا بِهَا الْكَلَامِ Believe this word. Allah Azza wa Jal says, we have made this Quran, no doubt about it, we have made it really, really easy. I didn't say that. T your teacher is not going to say that. Allah said it. But He only put a condition. It's not easy for everyone. It's not easy for everyone. He said, Live dikri. 
only for people who want to remember Allah. If you want to remember Allah, Allah gives a guarantee He's made it easy. That's His guarantee. Fahad bin Muttakir? Anybody out there want to remember me? Literally means for Allah, anyone, anyone out there want to put some effort to remember me? Because I made it easy. Now our, the challenge on us is, are we the people who want to remember Allah or not? That's really the challenge left. May Allah make us the people of Qur'an like the Messenger envisioned us to be. May Allah make us understand the beautiful legacy of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa And may Allah help us appreciate the un, unthankable gift, the unimaginable you know, a gift whose value cannot be placed, that, that gift of Qur'an. May Allah help us, our families, our children, our, our men, our women, our old, our young. May Allah help all of us appreciate this powerful and beautiful gift. And may Allah truly help us become Ummatan Wasata. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim wa nafa'ni wa iyaakum bil ayati wa dhikr al-Hakim.